cyclooctatriene, tetraene, okay? And they said it's not conjugated right. and there's no resonance. Right. But why is it not conjugated? That was actually covered briefly in the videos. I don't know if you remember when you looked at that one. But yeah, let's go through that. Like, I didn't understand what they meant by it has a geometrical isomer and it has localized double bonds. Let's start with benzene. Oh yeah, I remember doing that. Because aren't the pi bonds going to be not overlapping? Oh, I know why it's not conjugated, because it's an eight-membered ring, so it's not flat. Yeah. There you go. Oh, no, okay. it's going to be up. Yeah, that's, be their like... description just didn't make sense to me, because it said, I don't know, it said there's no resonance, because it has a geometric isomer or something like that, and I was like, the geometric isomer is going to be that one, and so when you draw the pi bonds, they're not even, uh, yeah, exactly. Okay, got it. So remember, what does, con what does conjugation mean? It means side-to-side -side overlap of three or more p orbitals. Side-to-side -side overlap of three or more p orbitals. Well, we can see how benzene fits that characteristic. Side-to-side -side overlap of all six orbitals. But you can see, you can only have side-to-side -side overlap of multiple orbitals if the molecule is flat. Of course, another name for flat is planar, but planar is just a, a pompous word for flat. If this wasn't flat, these couldn't all be parallel to each other. All of the p orbitals have to be parallel, so they all can have side-to-side -side overlap. That's why one of the characteristics for Huckel's rule is to be flat. Because if you're not flat, you're not even conjugated in the first place. And remember that conjugation is really the real basis for resonance. Resonance, the real reason why electrons can be delocalized by resonance is because there's all this overlap of the p orbitals. Well, as it seems like you guys have already figured out, um, how do you draw this? So this is cyclotetraoctene, cyclotetraoctene, a conjugated, well, um, it's cyclooctatetraene. Cyclooctatetraene. That's right, cyclooctatetraene. Anyway, this turns out not to be flat. This looks like this. It's what's called tub shaped. And because it's tub shaped, only these orbitals are parallel to each other. These orbitals are off to a side. I didn't really draw them that great, but the point is they can't be parallel to these because they're off on the sides of the tub. So there's no way they can be conjugated with the other orbitals. So this is not considered a conjugated molecule, and there really aren't resonance structures. It seems like you could do resonance, but the resonance really is based on the side-to-side -side overlap of p orbitals. This is why you can't just rely on the electron pushing arrows. It's better to have this deeper understanding of conjugation. Um, and I mentioned in the video series, normally you can't really figure out whether something is flat or not just by looking at it. You have to make a model. So normally your instructor just expects you to um, assume that things are flat. However, uh, they do kind of expect you to know that this particular example is not flat. So up to seven membered rings are flat, and then above that are not. Uh, anyway, you, you would be expected to assume that. I don't know if they all, if they all are, but the ones you're going to be given, you're expected to assume that they're so flat. And I, I wouldn't even say that above seven they're not flat so much as you're expected to just have memorized that this eight-membered ring is tub-shaped. And the other ones, I actually would, I would assume they're flat unless you're given a reason not to. Seven is flat, right? I, I don't even know. Sometimes seven can pop up. You, you wouldn't notably be expected to not. The only ones that you should know that are not flat are ones your instructor specifically mentioned in class. You're not expected to be able to figure out whether something is flat. So they're asking us to compare subolysis for these two cases, to compare the subolysis. What, what's the name of a subolysis reaction? What, what, what type of mechanism does subolysis mean? E1. SN1. SN1. Subolysis is SN1. It's another name for an SN1. It's an SN1 where the solvent is the nucleophile. Subolysis is an SN1 where the solvent is a nucleophile. Usually solvents are not very good nucleophiles, so you have to wait for the leaving group to leave. Now we want to know which of these would be better for subolysis. First of all, we have to identify the leaving group. Well, if we're going to do an SN1, this would be a good leaving group. It's the SN1 where the nucleophile is the solvent? That's right. Commonly, you would use, say, water or alcohol. Here they're using, a, uh, here they're using a, a derivative of ethanol, so they really are using an alcohol solvent.
Incidentally, this is not a leaving group that we've seen used a lot in the past, but we shouldn't be surprised that it's a good leaving group. This negative charge is well stabilized by resonance and induction. There's another resonance charge with a negative, another resonance structure with a negative charge is on this oxygen, and the fluorines are stabilizing by induction. So we're not expect, we're not surprised that this leaving group leaves. Now the, we have to figure out which of these intermediates is happier. Which of these intermediates is happier? Well, we're supposed to use Huckel's rule. Is this molecule aromatic, anti-aromatic, or non-aromatic? Non-aromatic. It's non-aromatic because... It doesn't even have a conjugated system. That's right, because... It's not completely conjugated. Yeah. How do you know that? Because it has sp3. Yeah, that's right. These two atoms over here are sp3. Why can't it be conjugated? Because sp3 atoms don't have p orbitals, as you saw in the videos. sp3 atoms don't have p orbitals, but in order to be completely conjugated, you would need an overlapping p orbital at every atom in the ring. So this is just non-aromatic. Remember that non-aromatic basically means normal. It's just normal. Now, is this aromatic, anti-aromatic, or non-aromatic? Anti-aromatic. Yeah. Now, is it completely conjugated? Yeah. Now, there's an sp2 everywhere. Every single one of the atoms in the ring are sp2. The substituents don't have to be sp2, but all the atoms in the ring are sp2. So it's completely conjugated. And how many pi electrons are there? But that falls into the anti-aromatic uh, list. So the top one is more stable, and that's why it'll be exothermic, and the other will be endothermic. So they were asking us to predict which of these subolases would be more would go faster. Well, this is going to go a lot faster because it's a lot easier to form this carbocation than to form this carbocation. This is the one they said was faster, right? Yeah. Okay. Why is this faster? Well, nature hates forming this carbocation because it's anti-aromatic. Remember that anti-aromatic means far less stable than normal, far less stable than you would normally expect. So this is far less stable than you would expect, um, and this is just a normal non-aromatic, so that's the reason. So one thing you have to watch out for then on the test is you have to look for opportunities to use Huckel's rule, even if it wasn't mentioned in the question, to, to, as an explanation for why a reaction is good or bad. Because here you would think that it was like, that one was more stable just because it's alkene, so it dies at like it's... Yeah, because like, the description they gave, they said that one was anti-aromatic, and then they said the one on top is allylic. So then you look at both of them, you're like, well, they're both allylic, and that one's doubly allylic, so right. it should be more stable. But Yeah, that actually is an excellent point. From chapter 14, we would have thought this was better because yeah, it was exactly. well stabilized by resonance. However, this new Huckel's rule argument trumps that. So yeah, that's a good point. All right, that looks like we're out of time. These videos are offered on a pay-what-you-like basis. You can pay for the use of the videos at my website. There is a link to my website in the info box. The address is www.freelance-teacher.com slash videos htm, or you can just use the link in the info box. By the way, I also offer tutoring via Skype and you can find more information about that Skype tutoring service at my website. Thanks.